Hi, welcome to Coffee and Closers. I'm Mikhail Abidor, and I want to personally invite you to join me and one of today's top performing sales stars for a cup of coffee and authentic conversation. And our collective goal is that you will walk away with tangible knowledge that you can apply to your sales efforts today. Are you ready? We'll grab a cup, fill it up, and let's get into another episode of Coffee and Closers. So before we get started, I want to thank some people. First of all, I want to thank you guys for coming. Uh, however you learn, and betterment is, is the key to success. So you guys are taking time out of your busy day. We're running a little bit late, so I thank you for being patient. Um, first off, for anyone that's watching this at home, or anyone that follows up and watches this at home, uh, I want to thank Jensen Studios back there for making that possible. Fun fact, 55% of, of the world's population, this is, this is a fact that we just, a statistic that we just looked up, 55% of the world's population watches multiple videos a day. And 90% of those people will make a purchasing decision, um, are most more likely to make a purchasing decision based on an educational or promotional video. So if you guys sell anything, go see uh, Jensen Studios after this. I want to thank our friends at WeWork. What? It's our first time doing this here, and we're, you guys have been so amazing. Um, only you guys could pull together, you know, like celebrities like, like Matt and the Driven, Driven team over there. So if you guys put your hands together for these guys. Best cold press in town. Um, so like I said, welcome to Coffee and Closers. My name is Mikhail Bedore, and when I'm not speaking in front of you, beautiful people, and running Coffee and Closers, I run a revenue growth agency called the Bedore Business Group. And what we do is we build high growth, top performing uh, sales and branding plans for uh, growing companies in the technical space. Uh, we also build teams around that, that process uh, to help execute it. So if any of that sounds interesting, it's Bedore Business Group fedorabusinessgroup.com, or come see us afterwards. Um, why we started Coffee and Closers was, we've been doing the sales game a long time, and we've been able to build a network of people that in our, in our lives were just friends. We realized as we grew up in the, in the startup space, these are people that most people just don't have access to. These are people that have taken companies from nothing to, in Jason's case, $50 million in ARR. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to bring these people to you guys so that in an open forum, a non-judgy non forum, you can ask any question that you've ever wanted to know about startups, sales, and or marketing. And this guy that I'm about to introduce to you has done all three exceptionally well. Jason took his company, Fission, from eh to 50 million in ARR. When he's not traveling globe, blocking out huge deals like Lifetime, Allianz, Capella, um, US Bank, and so on, he's also mentoring uh, revenue growth for other technical, local technical startups like Advocate, Bolero, Social360, and more. He's a, he's a good man. He's a dear friend. And uh, I'm so excited to share him with you. you. Guys, put your hands together for Jason Mitzo. Thanks, buddy. How you doing, man? Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks Morning, for joining us. Morning, everybody. So before we get into the questions, I want to... What I what I miss there? Fill in the blanks. I want yeah, to get well, everyone else gets to know. I think it's important first off, guys. Uh, there are free you know free coffee and pastries over here. Um, I've, I've told a few folks here this morning that uh, what I let down up here, uh, they'll they'll make up for over there. So, uh, but do I do appreciate you guys coming this morning. Thanks you guys. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, Mickey and I go way back. Um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to open this by first and foremost saying thank you. Uh, not only do I appreciate all of your time here uh, this morning, but I appreciate you you having me here this morning, my friend. Absolutely. Um, I just had some conversations ahead of time, and uh, this gentleman has done as much for my career over the last 20 years as uh, probably anybody that I know. And um, as you guys uh, who know Mick well, he's one of the most passionate people that I know. So, um, you know, Mick White, what's up, Mick? Uh, had asked me, uh, you know, uh, so what, what inspires you to do this this morning? One, I don't miss an opportunity to spend time with Mr. Bedore uh, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be selling better here this afternoon as a result. <laughs> uh, but secondarily, you've done a lot for me uh, throughout my career. So um, thank you. happy to do it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm going to borrow that, wipe these tears. If you don't mind. I know it's supposed to look cool, but no, thank you. Yeah, it means a lot, especially coming from someone I respect yeah. like you as my. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, kind of Cliff Notes version, guys, of uh, my backstory. And, and Mick sold it way better than I'll be able to sell it. But a uh, uh, longtime enterprise guy, um, not necessarily a longtime technology guy, but uh, we'll get into that later. Longtime enterprise guy uh, who decided to, uh, to, to, to try the entrepreneurial path uh, 10 years ago, nine years ago. Uh, started this venture, had absolutely no idea uh, what I was doing. Still, a lot of days, I have no idea what I'm doing. Uh, and it's even, we, we look back and reflect on, on some of those early days. 
and we think about the, the value proposition early on, it was a day to day. Uh, I mean, it was a week to week. You'd ask me one day, what do we, you know, what, so what, what is the, the purpose driven methodology that you guys are bringing to your clients and partners? The answer today was, was much different than what would be next week. Um, so we've had a lot of, a, a, a lot of trials and errors and, and a, lot of, a lot of good days and bad days. And I know we all here as consumers of content, of consumers of brand, all the great stories coming out of uh, all these great things, uh, but uh, it took a lot to get there. You don't hear about the 99 falls and, and, uh, right. and, uh, and, and not good things before you, you have the one good thing happen. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, current state, uh, as Mick referenced, uh, this, this entrepreneurial path started for me with a, a company called The Social 360. Uh, it's an agency, uh, Twin Cities based. Uh, wasn't an agency guy, decided to launch an agency. We had some early success with it, but without going into a lot of detail uh, during the opening, um, scalability was always our issue. Project-based work, commoditized business, it was, a, it was a challenge and it was always my white elephant. Um, how do we scale this, this concept to, to grow bigger and better? Uh, and that's where Fission came along. Um, we've got uh, four owners in, in Fission. Uh, one of them was uh, one of the founding uh, principles of Lifetime Fitness uh, and it came from an idea. Uh, and the idea was simplification of brand distribution. So Lifetime Fitness way back in the day, this was their, their COO, had gone to market with their marketing team, basically looking for a product or a series of products that could create one harmonious experience of storing and managing content, uh, distributing content, the individualized user business rules and permissions, and then finally determining the reporting or, the, or what's working as, as it relates to that content. The challenge was uh, a product that was, it was really in tune to end users who were nece not necessarily the most tech savvy people on, in the world. Secondarily, from a, from a management or an admin side of the equation, something that's really streamlined as it relates to making ongoing changes and recalibrations. And there was, at the time, 10 years ago, there was nothing that existed, so we decided to build it. And, uh, and that's where we are. And you've had a little success. I've had a little bit of success, <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, yeah. well, um, speaking of that, you know, people, people know you're successful, you wouldn't be here if, if you weren't. But I think what people don't focus enough on, especially in the startup landscape, is failure, right? I mean, has anyone here ever failed? <laughs> Patch, put your hand down. We all know you've never. <laughs> I'll vouch for that. I'll vouch for that. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear. Uh, maybe we could learn uh, about that today. Like, tell us about a time where you failed. Um, you, you you accepted a challenge. You thought you could overcome it. You bombed. And what you grew, or what you learned and grew from. Yeah, and that's that's every day. And uh, can you guys speak up a little bit? It's kind of hard. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, real quick show of hands, guys. I, I know we've got some, uh, some entrepreneurs in the room, and so wearing multiple hats. But in, in a traditional sense, how many marketers do we have in the room right now? Jim? Okay. And, and, and pure sales folk in the room right now? Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Well, I've, um, I've always been a sales guy. Um, you know, and, and I, I look back and I think back to, to my earliest years. I've always been a sales guy. Um, you know, call it, uh, you know, from the moment I could walk, channeling my, my, my inner Gary Vee, if you will, but um, the youngest of, of, of four kids uh, in my family. Um, I recognized early on that your attention is my religion. And, and what I mean by that, I was always vying for attention. Attention from my siblings, attention from my parents, coaches, teachers. Uh, and it was selling. And I didn't recognize it as selling at the time, but it was, it was tr something that I, I took true to heart. And even at a young age, it became something that strategically, I was always trying to recalibrate systems and processes that are going to create you know, compelling action on, on, you know, on the recipient side. And what, what happened as the youngest of, of four siblings, even as a kid, is I had my, my siblings, two older brothers and, and a sister, all successful in their, in their relative careers. They'd come to me in positioning elements to my, my parents. Uh, so my parents ever see this. Uh, but they'd always come, they'd always come to me uh, you know, amongst the, those types of things. But it was always based on this concept of your attention being my religion. Fast forward later in life, uh, as I embarked on my professional career, I really started to understand that whether you're on the marketing side of the house, for those folks that are on the marketing side of the house, or the sales side of the house, it's the one common denominator that really ties us all together. We're all vying for attention. We're vying for attention from clients and partners and media and investors and, and uh, the sky is the limit, but we're all vying for attention. So uh, you know, call it 29-ish years of my life. Um, I've, uh, I don't know, why, why are people laughing at that? I don't understand that. Um, I, I've been working. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I've been working really hard at, at that concept of the, the attention concept. So, Fast forward to now, uh, failures. Uh, you know, I was having a conversation with a gentleman uh, at the beginning of today's session about this as well. Uh, you know, we have a lot of failures in our business, right? We look yeah. early on, and, and you know, you were you were a, a, a soundboard to me during some of these, these this tenure. When we started this uh, this SaaS platform, Fission, 
our first year in business, we thought we brought you know traction principles, right right butts, right seats. Uh, we had the right financial backing. We had the right product set. It came from a, a very particular market need. Uh, my partners and I were very specific on on uh, you know kind of what our roles and responsibilities were going to be. We thought year one was going to be our, our really our breakout year. Uh, we closed two enterprise deals uh, in the first three months of doing business. Uh, anecdote to that is based on previous relationship. Um, so we had some early ego. We had some early confidence that was based on a false reality. Two deals in the, in the first three months, we blanked for the rest of the year. Um, and that was a challenge for us. And it really, uh, you know, we look at the first probably 18 months of our business, and we were relying so heavily on, you know, two deals. And these aren't full, you know, full rollout deals, right? We're, these are phase one rollouts. Um, we had, those, had to have those conversations about, you know, is this a close the doors, turn off the lights type conversation, right? Yeah. Um, and that was a big challenge for us. So as part of our growing up process in, in running this company, we had to understand that uh, we need to take a step back. We need to let st start you know, letting our customers, let the marketplace tell us why we're good, and more importantly, why we're not good, and then go from there. So Friends and family plan. Right. Does anyone, I mean, if you ever built a company, everyone expires a friends and family plan. It's just amazing when that waterfall happens, you're like, oh boy. Yeah. Now I got to really start being right. a company. Right. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, of course. So let's talk about success. I mean, yeah. from that failure, obviously, you know, you, you said you talk about year one and then blank the rest of the year. What did year two, year three? I mean, what have you learned? Yeah, from you know, it's uh, you know, we're we're all old friends in this room now, right? So it's 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 the stages. Trust that. It's the you know, the, yeah, right. It's the stages of growing up, right? We needed to act more like a like a real company at, at every stage gate. So one, like I'd mentioned, is this idea of of you know, letting voice a customer, let, uh, letting voice a marketplace uh, drive how we continue to evolve, right? Um, our, our minimum vial product, which was really our, our only existing product for the first two years of, of doing business, um, we had some misconceptions, both on, on perceived market uh, perception, perceived valuation, uh, a whole varietal of things, right? So, so that was part of it. We were really specific on hiring practices as well, right? We leaned on a lot of your guidance there, right? Pulling in uh, additional uh, building out this team and these various, the various stage gates of our respective business to really make sure that uh, as we're growing this company, we're, we're doing it the right way. Um, you know, further years, future growth, which we'll, we can get into later, uh, you know, establishing a channel strategy, really understanding how we can make our jobs easier and our sales processes much easier and, and working smart, right? Um, you, my teams have always known, and there's some of them in the room right now, that, that we've always been advocates of of, of working smarter, not harder, that uh, don't mistake activity for achievement concept, right? That's always been something that's driven what we've done. So we really needed to, to hold ourselves accountable. We've also, we, we sell collectively. We've gone to market collectively, and that's a big thing for us, right? Um, you know, we think about sales processes and, and even individualized go-to-market processes. Your buyers these days, especially at the enterprise, are buying by committee. That's a fact of the matter. They're not buying as individuals. They're buying by committee. You've got influencers and decision makers that are, that are all weighing in on this product. Why not sell as a committee, right? I got, there's guys in this room. Where's Steve DeWeese? Steve DeWeese, CFO of Fulcrum Health. He's uh, been a, a, a personal advisor of mine that I've reached out to on a handful of occasions. I've been in complex deal situations. He's got no vested interest in, in helping me win this deal, other than he's another guy who's way smarter than me and, uh, and, and will, will help me kind of guide those, those processes on, on certain segments, right? So that's been something for us, that, too, as part of that growth of, of sell by committee. You talk about channel partners, and I want to break yeah. from, but does it, oh, do, you, do you guys know what channel partners are or do? Most people? Anybody not? Again, trust Nest. You can admit if you don't trust Nest. That's the whole point <laughs> of this deal. Um, do you want to just really quick just give, give a commercial on channel partners? We have just done an absolute, throughout my enterprise life, we've, we've leveraged them, but I never leveraged them enough. And now that we are in our yeah. spot here, we yeah. definitely do. And it's such an affordable, right. I mean, it just multiplies your your sales force. Yeah, outstanding, right? So yeah, traditional channel partner strategy, right? We identified ourselves as a MarTech product, digital asset management, sales enablement, uh, as it relates to our SaaS platform. We understand the MarTech landscape is upwards of 5,000 different products, and it's going to grow 27% this year alone in the MarTech landscape. And we're talking everything across the board, from CRM to web analytics to, to sales enablement, digital asset management, content management, the whole gamut of, of MarTech products. It's a big space. There's a lot of clutter in that space. We were actually influenced by one of our current partners, Marketo. Uh, for those of you who know Marketo, leader in the marketing automation space. Uh, Marketo and, and Fission worked initially early on. This was pre their Vista uh, acquisition. Uh, they were acquired by Vista Equity, as many of you know, for just under $2 billion a couple of years ago. And we looked at them as pre-acquisition. Uh, they had bottom funnel inefficiencies, meaning they did a great job, top funnel, campaign management, more traditional lead, lead generation type. But where, where they fell short is, is bottom funnel. So you've got that MQL for those marketers in the room that's getting dropped into that, that CRM bucket of that, uh, that sales rep. 
Marketo's doing a great job, you know, feeding that funnel. But now what, is the, what do those reps have to bring that from contact to close? So we worked very closely with them. But it was all driven by, and, and my teams have always known this, uh, there's probably a, a, a catchier title, but this bank deposits philosophy. You have the same thing. It's this idea that when, when, we're, when we're meeting other businesses, partners, folks like yourselves, we're all about adding value. And it's a cliche, and everybody's saying it. We're always trying to add value. Uh, we are literally always trying to add value. The number of touch points that we, we might have in a, in, a, in a partnership strategy, in a, in a, in a go-to-market or sales process, even in everyday life, it's all about what can we do for you first. So when the time comes that we're ready to make a withdrawal, let's, let's ask for that, uh, that, that partnership. Let's ask for that, that contract, so on and so forth. It's a byproduct of the process, right? So we understood with this Marketo relationship that uh, partnering with best-in-class providers that are in complementary technologies, non-competitive, was really important to us, right? It started with Marketo. It's grown big since then, Salesforce, and, and even niche players as well. But it's, it's, been a, it's been a big thing for us. But it's all based for us on this pretense of what can we do for you, uh, and then time for us to make that withdrawal. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, you talk about process, uh, sales process, yeah. right? And could you just kind of talk, walk us through your, your sales process? Everybody has, people don't realize that about salespeople, the, the good ones are probably the most boring in regards to their setup. They run a process each and every time, which allows us to just be natural, right? Yeah. People, people always think, oh, they just walk into a room because they've seen some, they've seen suits on TV or whatever. It is the opposite of what most, you know, most of the elite salespeople how they perform. It's always right. following some process they've developed over the years. Could you walk us through your process? Yeah, absolutely. You know, from, from kind of beginning to close, and then maybe maybe pair it up with a deal that you won because of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah great question. You know, and this this is varied too, right? So so one thing that I, I want to point out, I referenced it earlier, is, is this uh, not mistaking activity for achievement. Uh, in my, my history, in my career, what I've seen as far as underperforming reps historically, uh, it's bad habits of wanting to go through and check boxes. They've got metrics around number of dials, metrics around number of touch points, metrics of whatever they're going to be held accountable for on a daily basis. And they're getting through those dials with no specific you know, end outcome or objective in mind. It's the activity component versus the achievement component. And you peel back the layers of that onion and you really press these folks and you say, okay, how did you move the ball forward on that phone call? Did you learn something new, right? Did you uh, identify a new player in the decision making process? Did you get the deal closer to close? You look historically over a, over a week or a, a quarter time period and say, you know, what is the value add now that you brought to those folks that you touched? Yeah, you made your 50 or your 100 dials in that particular day, but where did you add value to that equation and where did that ball, you know, ball move forward, right? So that's first and foremost, right, is not mistaking activity for achievement. And I can't, I can't emphasize that enough. Another thing, and we talked a lot about this last week in, uh, at, at, uh, at Summit in San Francisco, is the concept of being fast, being fearless, and being bold, uh, being different. Right? There's a lot of clutter, there's a lot of messaging out there. And the idea of, of, of doing things differently uh, is, I think, a critical part to, to any pro process, right? Whether you're, you're trying to sell a direct deal, establish partnerships, so on and so forth. Um, a quick little anecdotal story, uh, and the gentleman's in the room, and, I, and he knows I'm going to tell this story, so he's probably smiling right now. But um, I'm going I'm I'm to go back, oh, it's I'm it's go back three, three, three years ago. And, uh, you know, it, it was kind of our first big wave of growth, right? So we put this PR blitz out there about we're going to double our headcount, we're doing all this hiring and really all facets of, uh, of, of our organization. And I had this guy reach out to me. We had a lot of guys, uh, you know, a lot of guys and gals reach out, but I had one guy reach out to me very specifically uh, asking about, uh, you know, our organization and, and we'll love to join the family and so on and so forth. And hey, I'll be honest, kind of got lost in the clutter initially. Um, you know, then uh, I'd have those strategic emails. He, uh, you know, I mean, we're all leaving digital footprints. So anybody in this room that's not social selling, you're leaving, leaving money on the table right now. Uh, for those in the room that know me, know probably a few things about me uh, first and foremost. I like scotch. Um, a lot. Yeah, I see some heads nodding right now. Um, and, when, and I see this too. <laughs> um, I like Chicago sports. Go Cubbies. Um, it's, it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty. I like him already. All right, good. Oh, yes, sir, Lake Forest. All right, good, good. Uh, it's pretty easy for me to, uh, it's pretty easy for folks in this room to understand pretty quickly and easily, you know, who I am as an individual. Well, all of a sudden, uh, oh, and, and that I like to golf, right? So all of a sudden, uh, this, this, this individual is getting craftier in the messaging. Uh, I'm getting things about, hey, I, you know, saw the Cubbies did this, or I saw that they had that trait. I'm compelled to act on a human-to-human -human level. The rea at reality, at the end of the day, we're all humans, and we're selling to other humans, right? So it became a situation that like he's, uh, I, he's hitting my emotional triggers. Uh -huh. You got the rational and the emotional, but he's hitting my emotional triggers on, on, on compelled to response based on, uh, on key milestones of what sits in me, right? So he's doing these things. Uh, all of a sudden, I get a, uh, I get a pack of golf balls, uh, custom golf balls that arrive at my office one day. 
uh, that had some custom language as it relates to our business and so on and so forth. I'm really liking the stage gates of what this guy's doing. Uh, our team all works out at the, the Target Center Lifetime most days over lunch. I'm on the treadmill one day, you know, huffing and puffing and, 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 and doing the deal there. Next thing you know, I got a, a guy, there's, you know, 75 treadmills open, but the guy's on the treadmill next to me, uh, you know, right now. Keeps kind of peering over at me, keeps kind of peering over at me, and I'm like, you know, what, what is going on with this guy, you know? So, uh, you know, to take a on little... On the creep level, what would you get, like, zero to ten? Uh, 175. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is creepy. <laughs> um, so, fast forward, um, not only did I agree to meet with this guy based on the, the outside the box, be bold, be fearless concepts that he was executing, yep. but I hired him. Uh, and he's nice. sitting right there, uh, Mr. Ward. <laughs> uh, and he's been a killer. And um, so that's that's process, you know, one of, of us of, of doing things differently, not mistaking activity for achievement, have a specific purpose driven methodology for everything that we're doing. Social sell, understand, you know, consumer footprints or digital footprints of the folks that we're selling to. Yep. Uh, you know, we've got uh, on average, it, I'll be honest, probably about, about an 11 point touch process that we do okay. between calls, voicemails, emails, LinkedIn's. Um, that's pretty average for us, is, uh, is, is about 11 touches. Wow, because band is usually, what, eight? So you yeah, guys go above yeah, and beyond. Cool. We do, we do. Um, but it's something where we've got a very specific purpose you know, with, uh, you know, with every stage gate of, uh, of outcome. And for us, it's, it's, meant, it's meant good things. Uh, over the last couple of years, you know, we talked about the idea of growing up as a company. You know, one of the early things that we did is, is really worked on our ICP, our Identify Customer Profile. So really understand, rather than, you know, uh, Tommy would ask me early on, who are you guys selling to? Anybody who will buy, buy our stuff, right? You fast forward and that became, no, there's, there's specific buyers that have specific needs, right? In our case, as a cloud-based SaaS around MarTech, it's organizations that historically have uh, a complex go-to-market structure. Uh, they've got a lot, of, a lot of digital content that they're trying to manage, uh, speed to market or regulatory compliance at the local level uh, in Ameriprise, a U.S. bank, so on and so forth, is critical for, uh, for, for what they're doing. So we really started to tailor down why companies that are buying our product or should be buying our product are doing, uh, doing just that, right? Uh, more recently, we've really started to get more account-based marketing and then more specifically, individualized buyer personas. So what we did is we broke apart not only who the companies that are buying our product are, but who are the buyers that are actually within those companies that are buying. The indecision makers, the influencers, et cetera, et cetera, within that. And we've got mapped out actually individualized personas for each one of these people. Joe, Pam, so on and so forth. So financial services, enterprise industry, uh, these are typically the types of buyers that, uh, that are, are, are influencing. From the, title the, to demeanor to? Exactly. Perfect. Exactly. That's and awesome. that's been huge for us, right? So we probably 24, 36 months ago, we made a holistic move from anybody who will buy, you know, primarily mid-market and up, to holistically enterprise. Uh, and now, you know, 8 to 12 months ago, we're really starting to see the fruits of that labor uh, come true, all based on, on, on those types of things. That's awesome. Well, i got one more question to ask you before yeah. we open it up. Um, tools, yeah. processes. I'm sorry, tools, books, processes, anything that you can share with these, these guys to, so they can take home tangibly. Yeah. What yeah. books have you read? What podcasts do you listen to? What processes? Oh, there's so much. Um, and I'll try, to, I'll try to stay shorter winded here, right? Um, you know, I and, and, and our teams, we try to take influence from everything around us, right? Um, I've had a chance to meet some of the folks in this room. I've learned a lot from the folks, uh, you know, in this room right now. Um, we were in, like I said, we were in San Francisco last week. I had an opportunity to meet Bill McDermott, uh, SAP CEO. Um, you know, of all the different folks that uh, we've had a chance to spend time with, this is just a personal anecdote, and some of my team who's in the room has heard me talk about this. This was more impactful than, than probably anything in, in, in recent memory. Um, not only does a guy like Bill McDermott have swagger just based on who the guy is as CEO of SAP, <laughs> but you hear the story of, uh, and, and I would suggest look up some of his, uh, you know, his podcasts and, and, his, and his videos, but hearing uh, uh, this guy's story as it relates to how he started, how he got his first job at Xerox, um, I'm not going to compare myself to Bill McDermott right now, but there was, there was correlations to the mindset that he had. He went in, you know, this morning, his dad was dropping him off outside, uh, had never had technology experience before, had worked in family delis and so on and so forth, and this was his dream job. And he went in, his dad said, you know, no, no, not too much pressure, son, and so on and so forth, uh, and he told his dad, I'm getting this job today, and I'm not going to leave until I get this job today, right? And that brings me back to my Oracle experience. Many moons ago, I was doing, doing the Oracle thing. Um, I had no reason, no right to be an oracle. And uh, there's a gentleman in this room right now that's probably smiling as I'm starting to tell this story. Uh, I knew less about technology going into Oracle than I guarantee anybody in this room currently knows about technology. I know there's a lot of great technologists in this room right now, right? And my, my team has heard me tell this story before, and I'm bringing this up again around this bold concept. But we went in, you know, Oracle's got uh, new hire training for all the you know, new sales uh, folks within the organization at the varying levels. 
So I'm sitting at the, at, at the Oracle building. I've probably got 100 different people in the room right now. And I remember vividly, and uh, Ryan, I don't, know, I don't even know if I've ever told you this story, uh, but I had at the top of my piece of paper, Enterprise Resource Planning, ERP, uh, e, the R and the P, uh, highlighted and, and underlined, because I could not remember what ERP stood for. <laughs> and I didn't want to look like a fool uh, in front of all, of all of these folks on specifically you know, what this was. But I thought, I'm going to be bold. And, and regardless of how well I do, nobody in this room is going to forget me. So what we did is John Costigan, you, you know John. He's a great trainer, uh, by the way. Infamous uh, you know, global sales trainer. John was, was leading the session. He's become a good friend of ours today. John was leading this session. One of the early things that he did, he said, I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer that's going to come up and, and role play, you know, so on and so forth. And what does everybody do? I need a volunteer. Everybody's looking down, you know, all of a sudden. Like, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm going to do this, right? I'm, I'm going to remember this. So Johnny, you know, you, all right, come up here. So I'm, I'm getting up, ERP, ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, Enterprise Resource Planning. So I'm locking this thing in my head of specifically, you know, what, what this means. And it went really well. Right? And I, that was my aha moment of, of, I can do this. So as it relates to now current state, I'm taking influence from you know, anybody that I can. Bill McDermott you know, being one, I'm reading his book right now. Steve Lucas, Marketo CEO, he just got, came up with a book called Engage to Win. I couldn't put it down for three days. Um, just got done, done, done reading that as well. I'm a big Zig Ziglar guy. Uh, yes. I'm a big John Wooden guy, right? Uh, I know a lot of you have read these books before. Um, um, yeah, so from a book-wise, ping me on Twitter. I've got a whole bunch of recommendations uh, you know, on, on that. Uh, beyond that, some of the you know, tactical strategies that we've always done, any time within our organization, uh, historically or current, that I've either changed product sets, I've changed regions, I've changed teams, I've changed companies, yeah. I've always gone in dedicating whatever that appropriate time period is, whether it be a week or a month, to doing nothing but talking to customers. Um, and it's been a little bit of a risk in certain situations, right? It's all about if you're not first, you're last kind of scenario. Yeah. We've got to get the traction going. But I've always, I've always gained a lot, and our teams have always gained a lot by going in and doing nothing but customer feedback first. If they're you know, newer customers, why did you select you know, our particular product or service, right? It was a competitive situation in most cases. What were the compelling factors of why you choose to, to buy from us? If this is more of a legacy client, why do you stay with us? You know, you're getting hit up every day from, from, from our competitors. What are the differentiators? And the learnings that we've had with that over time have really turned our, our process upside down. Every single time we do this, we come in and, and have these preconceived ideas of really what those drivers are, and every single time we're completely wrong. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That was awesome, man. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much. I mean, from, from our perspective, I've learned so much. Uh, I'm, she's taking notes, so I don't have to be the guy scribbling. But this has been Pretty fan. empty page, so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so big question to you guys. Was this worthwhile? Should we keep doing these things? Yes. Should we th so let's congratulate this guy for doing a great Thanks job. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, buddy. Thank you. All right. So what do we think? What did you learn? Well, if you like that, check out coffeeclosers.com for upcoming episodes, recordings, and more. And don't forget to check out our sponsors. Each one has been hand-selected. They are best in class. Until next time, we'll see you at the next Coffee and Closers. Cheers.